uh, of jurists based in Yangon in Myanmar from 2013 to 17, establishing the organization's office there and implementing programs on access to justice, judicial independence, and business and human rights. Michael Charney is professor of Asian and military history at the School of Oriental and African Studies in London. He recently joined the Center for International Studies and Diplomacy, also at SOAS, and now has a joint appointment between history and CISD, having spent nearly two decades um, in the Department of History when I was a student over there, um, of his several research interests. Uh, in his work, uh, Michael has also researched on the emergence of religious and national cultures in Myanmar, Burma, and the Greater Bay of Bengal region. Elena Maria Q is Senior Researcher and Head of Research Unit at the Danish Institute for International Studies in Copenhagen, and is the ed editor of the volume of Essays, Everyday Justice in Myanmar, Informal Resolutions and State Evasion in a Time of Contested Transition, which is around, uh, around which we, the panel discussion this afternoon is, is focused. This volume, which is published by the Nordic Institute for Asian Studies, it, Press, NIAS Press, is now available to buy online. For those of you in the United Kingdom, you can also pre-order it from Waterstones and an electronic version of the book will also be available very soon. Meetan Sonpoin is currently Senior Research Officer at the Enlightened Myanmar Research Foundation, MREF, and is a member of the Everjust Research Group. She has conducted research on perceptions of women's participation in politics in Mon State in Myanmar and joins us today from Myanmar, uh, where it is quite late. So thank you very much for joining us. Hans Steinmüller is Associate Professor in Anthropology here at the London School of Economics and an Associate at the Sosui Hock Southeast Asia Center. Hans has since 2017 in particular, published research on Myanmar, mostly on the Wa State and Wa region about which he'll say a bit more himself and has very kindly agreed to moderate the discussion today. Hans. Thank you very much, uh, Nilanchan, for, for the introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I am an anthropologist of, uh, of China, primarily. And in the last few years, uh, I've, I've become interested in the Wa state. I, I literally crossed the border from China, and I still feel a newcomer to Myanmar research. Um, there are, however, many interesting uh, similarities and possibilities for comparison between, between China, but uh, specifically between the Wa state and other areas of Myanmar. And I really enjoyed a lot reading this uh, volume that uh, Helene Kied and Tang Son uh, have edited. Um, I think it's um, one of the uh, great examples of, of a new um, uh, search of a new blossoming of, uh, of research on Myanmar based on um, empirical fieldwork by anthropologists. And um, it really takes one of the core um, uh, anthropological um, frameworks for understanding justice, for understanding conflict re resolution to Myanmar. And this is the kind of general anthropological approach of legal pluralism, understanding um, justice and, and conflict uh, mediation as uh, a form of dealing with um, uh, plural legal frameworks. And um, it's an approach that is very kind of uh, specifically focused on emic and local perspectives. And um, that in itself is extremely valuable. And um, the various case studies of the, the volume, there, there are 10 um, uh, substantive chapters that uh, deal with places from urban Yangon to to Nagaland uh, and Pao, so um, uh, covering a lot of um, different areas of of Myanmar. Um, the various chapters present in depth uh, empirical case studies of um, of conflicts, of sometimes court cases, criminal cases, even. But, but most of them uh, on focus on local practices of uh, brokerage, of, uh, of, of conflict, of uh, um, uh, local norms, how they are, they are instituted and, and, and established. And um, the kind of the general tendency, the, the general, the, the gist of, of many uh, arguments made in the different chapters is 
that there's a strong preference for, for local informal conflict resolution, that many of those local actors are very distant from um, the Myanmar state and, and its uh, legal system, and sometimes even um, consciously and, and uh, purposefully try to evade the state. Um, and that a, a lot of these uh, problems of justice have also to do with, with other issues of uh, uh, um, uh, social relations, such as um, identity politics and religion. Um, uh, so far, so good. And we will hear more about the volume now from uh, the editors. And then we will have uh, comments from Michael Cherney and Daniel Aguirre. Um, uh, let me just add one point as an, as an anthropologist, uh, further directions of research. Um, in, the, in the introduction, the uh, editors raise specifically the, the challenge of research on the courts itself, on the, the, the legal system, um, uh, which obviously is, is difficult because of difficulty of access. And, and more research could be done on NGOs. As an anthropologist, I also feel more research could be done on the local notions themselves in even further depth. For instance, what con constitutes, constitutes accountability, responsibility, intentions, and such things in different local systems and how uh, ideas of justice compare to, for instance, practices of care. But that's just an idea to start it off with, and I really look forward to the discussion. And I hand over now to uh, Helene and Tang Son, who will introduce the volume. Thank you. Sorry, before uh, Helena, you begin, could I just say to those of them who are watching, more than 50 people are watching at the moment, that if they would like to ask questions, then please could you uh, put them in the Facebook page and we will be sure to ask them at the end of the event. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, first to Nila Jan for organizing this um, and to the LSE and um, Institute for Asia Studies uh, and also Hans for giving this very generous uh, introduction to, uh, to the book, uh, Everyday Justice in, in Myanmar. And uh, I'm just going to say a little bit generally about uh, the book, the main insights that come through. And there will be a little bit of repeat maybe of what Hans said, because you, uh, I think you sort of hit the nail on, on what the book is about. And then Tang Son will uh, present specifically insights from chapters one and two of the book. Um, and um, I just wanna start by saying uh, how this book came about, just to give a little bit of context. So it, it came about as the result of a research collaboration between uh, the institute that I work at, the Danish Institute for International Studies and the uh, Enlightened Myanmar Research Foundation, which is a research NGO in Myanmar and then the anthropology department at Yangon University, and also here in Denmark, uh, researchers from Aarhus University, where we collaborated together since 2015. So it's really the result of working close together, doing field work together and analysis together. So just to give that a uh, bit of a background. And really what our objective with the project and also this book uh, was, was to look uh, at the very local level, as Hans also indicated, looking at how do people address the crimes and disputes that they face? Um, where do they go to, which justice providers, which actors do they go to, uh, what forms of authorities do these actors uh, constitute. And also, as Hans alluded to, we were also very interested in knowing what perceptions of justice and how do they understand the crimes and the conflicts that they face, not bringing sort of like a fixed legal normative framework of uh, understanding justice, but really being open to uh, localized, uh, culturally, religiously, socioeconomically and historically formed perceptions of justice. So this is really what we wanted to get out uh, of, uh, of the research using, as Hans said, an anthropological and an ethnographic approach to these uh, questions. And with this, uh, I hope, and I think the book is, is also uh, showing this, that with these very localized uh, studies, we are also able to bring light and shed light on some of the larger issues that are going on in Myanmar, um, on state formation processes, on relationship between state and citizens, uh, on the peace process, uh, on identity politics, and also on how authority is constituted in various ways in a country that has undergone many, many years of armed conflict, uh, mil a military regime, uh, splits between different ethnic groups, like through this very localized lens of looking at the question of justice to shed light on those uh, issues. 
And I think that's also, this perspective is also why we have this concept of the everyday, which of course can be criticized for, for, from different angles, but at least for us, it has two meanings. Um, the first meaning is that uh, what we really wanted to capture with the everyday was that we are looking at ordinary, quite uh, uh, routine, uh, often occurring kinds of kinds of disputes uh, in villages and wards, rural and urban areas as opposed to focusing on the bigger justice issues, on mass atrocities, on extreme human rights violations. Yes, these provide a very significant context for what we're doing, and sometimes there are significant interlinkages, but we really wanted to focus on the everyday in terms of the ordinary and the frequent, uh, um, what is happening at the local level. And the other meaning of the everyday is much more in terms of our analytical approach, uh, a mode of thinking about social life uh, and politics that moves beyond looking at macrostructures, at elite politics, and at abstract processes, and trying to really capture the, the multiplicity, multiplicity of practices and perceptions, and the agency also of what we can call most of the people, I think Gupta called it that, or the ignored people, people on the margins of the state, but also people in the slum areas of, uh, of Yangon, uh, the women, the economically deprived minorities. So this is really uh, our focus um, in the book. Um, but we're also interested in how this links up to and shed lights on the bigger issues, uh, on the bigger issues, the bigger challenges and, and uh, uh, contestations around uh, uh, what has since 2011 been denominated as the Myanmar transition or the triple transition in terms of economy and politics and, and moves towards peace, but which we all know and people listening today knows that this is a very contested uh, form of transition. So uh, Hans, you already mentioned uh, our theoretical approach. We are anthropologists. Uh, I would say that we combine legal and political anthropology because indeed we are very interested um, in politics and power dynamics and how that interacts with the field of justice provision. So not taking a purely a legal perspective, but actually very interested in looking at justice, not as a neutral apolitical field, but as a field that is also infused with competition between actors in the provision of justice, in positioning themselves in local fields, between the local and the extra local fields, but also as part of politics and claims as resistance to the state. So a lot of the chapters also look at uh, ethnic armed group justice systems, ethnic uh, civilian organizations justice system, and how those are also part of claims to some form of self-determination or resistance to, uh, to the state, or at least challenges to the state. So this is one of the things that we really wanted to bring into the legal pluralism debate. This is not completely new. I've also done it in my other work, others have done it. Um, but in the Myanmar context, I think this, or I'm hoping that this will contribute uh, uh, to the debate also about justice sector reform. Another thing that Hans also briefly mentioned is something that's not been very strong or evident in the legal pluralism debate, and that is the role of identity politics and religious and religious beliefs, which a few of the chapters, well, a number of the chapters actually look at. And I think uh, for me coming originally from a Southern African background, it was very interesting to see also how Buddhist beliefs uh, but also Christian and animist be beliefs are animating, so to speak, this field of justice, an area that has actually been quite overlooked uh, in Myanmar, except for the studies that spe specifically focus on, on spirit mediums, on that, but not really connected to the, to the justice field. Uh, and it was very interesting when we first started the research project uh, and we talked about this open approach to who are justice providers uh, in Myanmar. Um, and of course, immediately people think about police officers, uh, court judges, village leaders, village tract administrators, but actually when we started to follow the real cases, the kind of case tracing that we've done, which we also explain in the introduction to the book, how we did that, we realized that a lot of what we could call religious actors, but who would never really self-identify as justice providers, were significant actors in the way that people address crimes and disputes. They didn't sit necessarily and act as secular sort of conflict mediators, but they were very significant uh, in, in, in terms of facilitating resolutions or simply uh, uh, meaning that people found peace with a case uh, uh, if it didn't uh, get resolved in the secular dom domain. So I think this is also, I hope, uh, a, a significant contribution uh, of the book. So we have a lot of case studies in the book. We cover a lot of areas and 
it is not a systematic comparison across uh, areas. I think that comes also a little bit with the anthropological, uh, inductive, exploitative approach that we've used. But in the book, there are, I, we would say, four sort of main findings, cross-cutting issues that cut more or less across uh, the book. And Hans, you mentioned already some of them, but let me just briefly mention them here. And Tang Son will take up some of them as well when she presents. But the first is, as Hans mentioned, is the strong preference for local and informal resolutions. So this is both in terms of preferring to have your case resolved uh, at the very local level. Uh, there's also quite a low level of reporting and we can come a bit back to that uh, in the discussion, but that people prefer to resolve cases at the village or ward level. And they prefer to have cases resolved using what we could call non-state, non-legalistic mechanisms of, of dispute resolution, reconciliation, compensation, um, uh, truth seeking through trials of ordeal and a very strong focus on social harmony, which is not something new to the legal pluralism debate. Laura Nader's classical work also speaks about social harmony. Um, so I think that there's a lot of comparative here, but this is one of the big findings at least that we uh, found. And then uh, the second one is a very, very strong element of what we in the book call state evasion or state avoidance. And of course, there's some links to James C. Scott's work on this in Myanmar, but with a little bit of a different take, uh, because we are also looking at areas where the state is very physically present. So uh, as Tang Son, uh, chapter and she might come back to this. I mean, it's not only about the state being physically far away, uh, but it is that people actually, even when they're close to police and court, they if they will travel far to seek uh, non-state justice systems like the armed uh, group uh, of that particular ethnic group. So a deliberate form of evasion, which is both linked to uh, contemporary forms of experiences and inefficiency of the state system, corruption, high fees, fear of formality and unformality with procedures. But of course, we also link this to the longer history of state oppression and, and can link this into this uh, deeper and historical con context uh, of distrust in the state. And I think an interesting finding in our chapter is that of course, this is a, a feeling of mistrust that's very strong amongst the ethnic minorities, but it is also the case in uh, Yangon uh, as one of the chapters show by uh, Easy Roads and as our other work in, in townships of, of Yangon have shown that it's not just the minorities, but also the, the Bama people who also try to avoid, uh, Bama is the majority uh, population in Myanmar, for those who don't know, who also try to avoid state, which I think is quite an interesting finding. The third uh, finding is uh, that the preference for local uh, systems of justice is not just a dislike of the state. So if you fix the state, people will run to the state. It's also informed by particular cultural and religious norms, as I said before. So we also take that as an explanation for why people seek local justice. We're talking about different conceptions of justice than sort of like a Western legal, uh, juridical, uh, legalistic understandings of justice. And that this is also very important to take into account when we're speaking about justice. Uh, sector reform. And uh, I, if you read some of the chapters in the book, you will see how Buddhist ideas about karma, past life deeds, influences strongly uh, whether people report a case or not, and also what type of justice that they seek. Um, you will also see that um, uh, people will 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 uh, uh, look to different cultural norms about social harmony and, and ideas about uh, when you put a case out in the public, it's associated with conflict escalation, with shame and loss of dignity. So there's a whole set of ideas and experiences that influences uh, the preference for local forms of justice that's not only linked to a dislike or a mistrust of the state. And then the last one is uh, identity politics. Uh, and for those of you listening today who are familiar with Myanmar, you know that identity politics plays and has played a very, very strong role in Myanmar politics uh, since colonial times and definitely also in post-colonial politics. And this is perhaps unsurprisingly also evident in, in the areas uh, of justice. And in our book, identity politics plays out at different levels in terms of the ways that people are both included and excluded from justice. So on the inclusion part, we will see that if 
a justice provider is from a particular ethnic identity, a person with that identity or ethnic identity or religious identity will feel more comfortable with seeking justice in that institution. But it also works exclusionary. And we have, especially a chapter by Michael Kraus and, and Anna Spencer who show how Muslims uh, in particular, but also Hindus to a growing degree, have lower access to both the formal and, and the informal uh, institutions. And then the other set of identity politics is the whole processes around getting customary law recognized by the state and the way that the ethnic armed organization and the ethnic civilian organization, like in the case of Naga, which is not an armed uh, movement, are codifying customary laws, setting up alternative dispute resolution systems as part of a wider sort of like process of nation building, ethnic nation building, um, fighting for self-determination uh, and so on. So it's both part of higher politics and it's also very much evident uh, in local level uh, dispute resolution. And Hans, I just want to know how much time uh, I have left because uh, if I have time, just I just wanted to share the list of contents so people just have an idea about um, the chapters that are in the book. Do I have time to do that? Would that be okay? Yes, I think that's that's fine. Okay. So let me just see if I can figure this out. Yeah, is it okay, Hans? Yeah, you can see it. Um, so no, I just wanted to uh, just for few of you will have the book already because it's just to now uh, being available uh, to purchase. But uh, so what you can see here is that uh, we cover a lot of uh, uh, some of the ethnic minority states, Mon state and Karen state. We've also done research in two of the uh, self-administered zones. Pau and uh, Naga, and there's quite a number of uh, papers on Karen states. And we also have two papers that focus on Yangon, one on a uh, Karen community, and the chapter by Elizabeth Rhodes, who's not part of the Everjust project, but uh, who has been working closely with us, has uh, a chapter on brokers in relation to property uh, transaction in, in Yangon. And then we also have a chapter uh, on uh, everyday justice in a refugee camp on the Thai side, but where the majority of people there are Karen. Uh, and that chapter also looks into uh, international interventions into this area of everyday justice, which is quite, uh, for us at least, quite an interesting uh, case study to add because these kind of efforts are also beginning in Myanmar. And if you look across these chapters, uh, there, uh, there are different topics uh, that goes through. Tang Son will we'll talk today about uh, in, a, in, a, in a minute about the role or continued role of armed actors and how they influence uh, justice uh, provision. Uh, we have a chapter on Naga, which is looking closely at this question of, of uh, recognition of codified customary law amongst minority groups and how that feeds into uh, Naga nation building and also how they respond and relate to the Myanmar state. Uh, we have a chapter by Marie uh, Richthammer, who was an intern in our project, who is now working in the UN in New York, who is looking very closely at um, how the preference for uh, local forms of dispute resolution is very much influenced by Buddhist and animist ideas, and how that is also part of undermining the legitimacy of the state uh, in uh, a Karen village. Um, then we have a chapter by Win Win Mon, which is in an area uh, in Yangon, uh, focusing on urban Karen people, which is also focusing again on the role of uh, religion, but also very much on how identity plays a role in not going to the state institutions and in the way that people perceive uh, security, uh, which works to the advantage to some respect to the Karen, but it also becomes like a micro mirror reflection of the way that ethnicity and identity is very compartmentalizing in, in Myanmar where uh, strangers are looked upon as security threats and where safety is associated with being with your own ethnic group. Um, then chapter six and seven are very interesting and they're also very interesting to read together because uh, at the moment, uh, there's a strong focus also in the international media and for very good reason on the relationship between Muslims and Buddhists uh, in, in uh, Myanmar. And, what these chapters do is that they're actually looking at villages in Karen state that are mixed Muslim and Buddhist, but both groups are Karen, and in different ways look at how these groups uh, are living together. And the first chapter shows that when they collaborate around uh, local dispute resolution and that there are no negative external influences, when you avoid external influences by state and by extremist nationalist monks, 
then the groups are actually able to avoid any kind of tensions or conflict. Whereas if we move to chapter seven, we have a different set of villages where it's a completely different situation where these external politicized influences igniting tensions between Muslims and Buddhists are having quite uh, uh, severe effects uh, for the relationships between the Buddhists and Muslims within these villages. So through this lens of looking at dispute resolution, justice provision, we were also able to look into some of these interesting comparative uh, dimensions of relationship, relationships between Muslims and Buddhists. Uh, then we have a very interesting chapter by Annika, uh, who looks at state effects using state effects theory and uh, is actually looking at how people's way of dealing with disputes and crimes at the local level is also having a negative effect on social relations. So you have sets of people within local community who don't even dare to seek local dispute resolution because they feel alienated from each other uh, in mixed uh, ethnic uh, areas. And this Annika explains as a result of these kind of negative relations, lack of state care, that uh, uh, poor slums, in this case in Molimia, uh, the, the capital city of Mon State, uh, has experienced through different kinds of evictions and uh, different kinds of lack of, 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 of services and lack of care from, from the state. Chapter nine, I've already mentioned, uh, by Elizabeth Rhodes and also Kirsten on the refugee camp. So this is just to give you an idea of the extent um, and the different topics that we're working around uh, in the book, despite that we have these sort of four cross uh, cutting issues. And uh, I will stop uh, sharing this now and then I will also stop talking and uh, give the word to, uh, to Tang Son, who will present chapters one and two and try to look at these chapters um, uh, comparatively. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Helen. Uh, yes, as Helen mentioned, I would like to present the chapter one and two of the book, where we particularly look at the role played by armed actors in justice provisions. Uh, I have co-authored with Helen, uh, Helena Maria K, the chapter one on uh, foreign shopping and plural authority in Southern Mon State. Uh, and the chapter two is co-author with my colleague uh, as the content already show uh, with uh, Nan Dini Lawind and focuses on the shared powers of armed actors in the OSEP administrative zones uh, located in Shen State. Uh, I hope Manan is here with us today. And our argument in these two chapters is that uh, despite uh, existence is fire after long histories of armed conflict, armed men still uh, in the shadow of underneath and beneath and the plural system of justice influence how crimes and disputes are addressed. Uh, and it influenced the security and justice situations for ordinary villages. And the two chapter board covers an uh, area that are ethnic nationality areas of Myanmar, and they have both uh, have a ceasefire agreement with the government since uh, the 1990s, and they are both uh, carried the right by misgovernance. Uh, on the, on the one hand, governance by the central Myanmar state, and on the other hand, governance by the ethnic organizations. In the Mon Valley chapter one, uh, the Myanmar state officially governs uh, the administrations, uh, but the new Mon state party, the MNSP, which is the main ethnic armed group to represent the Mon people, it uh, still has uh, actual authority in the village and sometimes villagers uh, tend, uh, tend to the MNSP with just the issue and other government matters. In the old village, uh, there is now a self-administrative uh, uh, self zone, which means that they, uh, they are governed by an administration of mixed uh, old organizations and uh, representative from the central state, uh, including the military. At the same time, the old national organizations, uh, BPNO, which is now a political party and have its own informal structures of governance and justice system. And next to it is the armed wings, uh, the old national army, the PNA, uh, which is now part of the military, and they still have links to the PNO. Uh, the villagers, uh, the village, uh, also have their own justice system and uh, village rules. In some, uh, there are areas with legal presence, uh, with a presence of authorities, and this includes authority who are armed actors. Uh, in these two chapter, we particularly focus on the question of what people in such plural context do when disputes and crime uh, cannot be resolved inside the village uh, by village leaders and forums. 
like in the rest of the book, the vast majority of cases uh, are resolved locally uh, in the Mon and Bo village. Uh, Nina already also mentioned a lot. And, and the village resistance uh, prefer by far to resolve uh, such cases locally rather than to go to the outside, uh, outside and upper level uh, institutions uh, like the state and the ethnic organizations. They also prefer to use uh, village principles and rules and like uh, condensation and recon uh, reconciliations and promised letter, uh, which we call can one uh, in Burmese language and uh, in one language and the one can in all language where, where we study. Uh, but sometimes uh, local, local resolutions are not possible. For example, it's not possible when there are large land confiscation cases or when they are drug uh, cases that involve powerful and armed actors. It's also difficult when external actors are involved as perpetrators. Uh, also sometimes village leaders give up on resolving, the, uh, resolving a case because the victim and the perpetrators cannot come to an agreement. We show, for example, this uh, in the chapter one, where we look at an arson case, in chapter two, where we look at a land and a drug case. By analysis, these difficult case, uh, cases closely, we provide uh, four important insights today. And firstly, uh, when cases cannot be resolved inside the village system, uh, it is very rare that people go to the official state institution like police and like cars. Rather, they try to uh, instead go to the different informal forums and actors that exist, like the MNSB justice system and uh, spiritual actors. More women than uh, men go to spiritual uh, actors for spiritual justice can be learned from uh, our first ever test book on gender express uh, chapter that I know, uh, which we find, yeah. Uh, and even a, a secret military office in the Mon areas, or like the BNO and the BNA in the Bo areas, uh, where they also trying to get help from MPs or other political persons. In general, uh, the use of informal forum is because uh, people do not trust that they will get justice in the official state system. Bringing one, uh, one case to the public place is associated with shame and loss of dignity and sometimes combined with fears of authorities. And these feelings are worsened if, uh, if you report a case to the former state institutions. Uh, the use of informal and ethnic forum is also strongly influenced by the long history of ethno-nationalist uh, conflict and the military uh, government oppressions of uh, ethnic minorities, uh, which has fostered uh, the, a strong sense that Burmese government officers, um, police, cause were, were be biased against the Mon and the Bo'u villages. When exceptions were a drug case in the uh, for all areas uh, where the village leader did uh, call the police because uh, the drug dealer was an outsider uh, and known as a former members of the Myanmar military. And that going through this system had high costs for the villagers and was not preferred, uh, but they felt that they have no choice. Uh, secondly, we also uh, a kind of foreign shopping, uh, uh, foreign sh uh, shopping among the informal forums and actors this means that uh, people try out different options to get the best outcome. And when it fails in one place, they move to the next. Uh, in, in these processes, uh, we, uh, we found that the village leaders play an important role in directing the people in the case to the, the uh, different forums. Uh, so it is not just a matter of free choice, uh, but also a question of following the advice of village leaders. In the Mon village, for example, it was clear that the village leader did not think that uh, it was good. Uh, it was good to go to the former state institution. So he had like a kind of gatekeeper. He sent people to the uh, to the informal institution, and he himself did not trust uh, the state institutions to give people uh, proper justice. Lastly, uh, we found that foreign shopping is no currency for justice and can be risky and costly. In some cases, foreign shopping work costly because it gives people more options to put uh, pressure on the perpetrators uh, to pay compensation and to come to an agreement. Uh, but it can mean going to many places. Uh, it can mean uh, many costs. Also, there is no currency that there will be an outcome because uh, 
the informal forums also not always have the capacity and they do not have the official authorities to enforce decisions. We, for example, see uh, this in the chapter one with the ASEAN case, where the MNSP had to give up on the case because the MNSP does not have uh, the state recognition uh, to enforce decision on, on public Twitter for people who live in the Myanmar government control areas. Uh, as evident in, in this ASEAN case, the whole process of foreign shopping is fraught with uh, unpredictability and chance uh, because you can never be sure of the outcomes. Victims must be persistent in continuously trying their luck and risk facing high, higher costs and burden at uh, every step. The accused is not sure to get a voice or a proper in, in investigation into his, capabil uh, his capability and in other cases that we follow, people, people, people give up on pursuing their case, cases to, uh, all together or went to the spiritual actors for advice um, and uh, on how to deal at a personal level with, uh, grievance, with their grievances. This underline that uh, you must be rather uh, courageous to engage in foreign shopping uh, as it's always involved uh, tradi uh, uh, additional burdens like financially and emotionally. <coughs> Firstly, <coughs> these two chapters show that arm actors uh, continue to play a critical role in the justice areas. Uh, they, sh uh, they shape how justice is provided and they can also shape how justice flow uh, when, uh, uh, when cases cannot be dealt with inside the village. This is particular, uh, particularly critical when the case themselves involve armed um, actors as perpetrators or uh, as supporters of perpetrators. In chapter two, we, we for example, show how the four armed um, actors were involved in a land confiscation case by a company uh, owned by uh, members of the organi organization and it left many villagers without ownership of their land. They never got all their land back because of the uh, powerful economy, uh, economic interests of the armed um, actors and uh, the organizations. Uh, in these areas, uh, we see overall how the Bo'o National Organization, BNO, uh, trying to protect the villagers and to provide them uh, with justice. And, but when the economic interests of the armed actors uh, are involved, uh, this is very difficult. Uh, in chapter one, we also show how, uh, how the ASEAN case ended up being resolved by the armed military officers from the Myanmar army in, uh, in one state, uh, in one village. They use their uh, arm power to enforce the decision. In this case, the victim did get justice uh, in the form of compensation from the perpetrators, but this came at a high cost and with the involvement of arm pressures. Uh, so to summarize, uh, militarized governance and plural, uh, plural authorities, plural authorities shape justice provisions and the relative um, access to sorry uh, the real, uh, militarized governance and plural uh, plural authority shape ju uh, justice provisions and the related access to justice that people have uh, or in this same time the deny uh, of justice the risks of bringing kids outside the village at the same time uh, uh, support the preference for village level resolution. Uh, in addition, it is important to understand the ambiguous and dual roles of ethnic armed and civilians organization in this three objective. They serve uh, in many aspects uh, uh, to protect ethnic villages and serve as a forum for uh, providing justice as alternative to the Myanmar, uh, Myanmar Myanmar state, but their capacity and ability to provide justice and security is not stable. Uh, on the one hand, we see how the lack of official authorities uh, and recognitions of the MNSB mean that the MNSB lack of the power to enforce the decision in criminals and other matters. Uh, uh, on the other hand, we see uh, the BNO is split between protecting the Bo'o people and serving uh, individual economic interests. Uh, related to land and business. The uh, BNO also have problem in controlling the BNA, its former armed wing, uh, and it, this makes just within the ethnic forum challenges, even when these forums are preferred to those of the official state. 
in the papers, uh, we, con uh, we conclude with some recommendation uh, to the governments and international agencies uh, in the areas of justice uh, sector reform. We, for instance, argue uh, that, uh, that the aim that the aim should uh, should not be to erase legal pluralism. Instead, uh, they should be a force to establish more relevant linkage between the multiple informal and formal forests. Uh, this this would include stronger legal back into those justice providing actors who are trusted by the uh, ordinary uh, villages, like the village leaders and the ethnic organizations. Supporting a more plural, a pluralized and inclusive system could also put in the right pressure on the official system to be more responsive to the justice uh, demands of ordinary villages. And secondly, a more empowerment should be uh, given to ordinary villages to uh, counteract that non justice provision is often more driven by politics and powers, and then uh, by a force to ensure the ordinary villager get the kind of justice they seek. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. The time is already done. Thank you very much, uh, Tang Soen and Helen, for those uh, summaries of the book. For it was a, a great overview, and um, especially with with Tang Soen, we we really got a lot of detail already about uh, the first two chapters, specifically on Mon State and uh, the Pao um, region. And and now I'll hand over to uh, Michael Chani for his comments. Hey, thanks for having me. Um, it's an important collection. The research is really solid. Uh, it's very rich empirically and theoretically. I didn't find any chapter in it from which I didn't learn something. And that's kind of unusual for an edited book. There's usually something, why did I just read that chapter? But I didn't find one of those. Helene also did an enormously effective job at spelling out all the issues in a very, very clear, succinct and non-jargony manner. So I'm going to make some comments and I'm going to be full of historians bias. Uh, so bear that in mind, and I'm going to focus on its general significance for understanding the country and where it's where it is long term, not just right now. The authority of state sources for justice do not suffer from not having absolute subscription only because of mismanagement and misrule since 1962. Now that mismanagement and misrule is true, and I think it's still happening now, but Burma has also historically long term suffered for the problems of a weak central state. The limited effective reach of state institutions has always been a condition of everyday life for people in outlying areas, not just ethnic minorities, but Bamars as well. This was true of the Slorik SPDC period when control was in the hands of the military. It was true of the high civil war period. The colonial state we know from Jonathan Saha's work discussed by Harrison in, the in, her, in their chapter was full of administrative corruption and legal plurality once you left Yangon and uh, Mandalay. And we know from the Kanban period outside the royal core and the myths, the imaginary of the, of the myths of the royal imaginary, that in outlying areas of the kingdom, state authority was actually very weak. Officials used violence in the name of justice to exploit, and villagers had to turn to village heads, monks, local strongmen, and the like to seek resolutions. And when they were unhappy, they migrated as a village somewhere else if they found no other recourse. On many issues, villages had to go to war with each other over water rights, land, cattle, issues of honor, family squabbles. And once they had used up the multiple systems of seeking resolution that were available, but none of which carried its own authority to put an end to the matter, they had to move on. I don't think the problem is just as uh, Aung San Suu Kyi and quoted in the book has said on this, that the judiciary doesn't work anymore or people do not have faith in it anymore. The implication being, of course, that at one time it, it once did. There has been a chronic absence of strong state authority equally throughout the reaches of the country that goes back centuries and for much of the country was not made any better under the British. This includes, by the way, what is referred to in the first chapter as form shopping, which I found a very useful concept, looking at multiple authorities for a favorable outcome. And I was struck by how much this mirrored the situation with alternatives in other areas of daily life. Take different systems of medicine, for example, in the country now and historically. It is this kind of moving around to find the best resolution where nothing has absolute authority is true. Can we, if this is true, can we isolate these developments first as developments and not as historical fixtures of society and cultures in the country? And if the latter is true, how much of this is actually caused by the civil war violence and military suppression and not some kind of persistent form of governmentality in response to authority per se. 
This is particularly true as the chapters make clear that even where forum shopping takes place, there's strong pressure to keep things local in the village with local authorities. And here we again come back to the basic building block of human society in Myanmar, uh, being the world of the village. This is an issue that comes from looking at the present and trying to make sense of it. Um, the, the book tackles the issue by looking at the present and trying to make sense of it. Um, but in some cases, they might want to put this or consider these issues in larger historical depth to um, pluralize for themselves a number of causes that fed into this, not just the post-1962 military phenomenon. I would argue that what is happening is due to the shambolic historical processes of centuries of state building and nation building in Myanmar. The problems put up by Bamar leaders to integrating ethnic and religious minorities into the nation on an equal footing. The limited reach of the state as a result of this, an exclusive Buddhist Bamar focus uh, on the, the Myanmar nation, or the exclusive Buddhist Bamar focus of the Myanmar nation as it's been constructed. And this also explains why there is a hierarchy for many with a preference for authorities drawn from the same ethnic group. Sometimes consequences are clearer than in others, but this is not because of an essential change at the ground level. We can see these results now because access is better for researchers, researchers are freer than they were maybe 30 years ago, and we have the kind of local research that we can, then, can do now that we couldn't do maybe a decade ago or two decades ago. One of the things I really like about the book is that the authors do not talk about Myanmar as a whole and in some generalized way where a nominal slice of the country speaks for everything else. Inside, it is a multi-centered collection with each author taking a particular geographical, economic, or ethno-religious locality and allowing the congregation of the multiple localities to develop our local picture of Myanmar. So we see Christian communities and Muslim and Hindu communities, those brokers involved in land deals in Yangon, Polk, Ren, and other ethnic groups, and so on, all responding to the options and constraints of the availability of the state and other sources of justice on their own terms in daily life. It is probably the only kind of approach that allows us to see Myanmar outside of a state-centered narrative through a state lens of how things look from the view of Napido or are supposed to look in Aung San Suu Kyi's mind's eye. One thing this approach allows us to see better is that even today, Myanmar's problems are not due just to Bamar governance. They are also due to human to the human and physical geography of the country. It's not an easy country for one state to rule. And I think arguably Myanmar would have been much better off if it had emerged historically as several different states. Outside of the central lowlands, it is not what James Scott calls natural state space. Pre-colonial, colonial, and post-colonial policy did not favor the transformation of the physical into virtual state space. And now the way the central state presents itself in, and not the way the central state presents itself now in documents uh, in which it constructs a very powerful imaginary of its authority. It's one of the reasons why some of those who work on legal and other texts in, in the pre-colonial period sometimes misunderstand the reach of the state because they take that royal imaginary as fact and so misunderstand the period and the nature of justice. And these imaginaries can be enormously influential and pervasive, as Harrison points out in their chapter, when villagers think of the Myanmar state today as the military, military state it once was. Uh, but in reality, the country is still essentially divided between lowland, what I would call Burmania, and highland Deptaic areas. The first treats the latter, as I think some, some uh, scholars have pointed out, more as colonial zones of the central state. Um, more uh, of the central state than areas of equal worth. And the military and colonial elites in these areas benefit from disorder that gives them an excuse to continue to exploit these areas in the same way. It would be useful to compare legal plurality in Myanmar with the situation in other countries in South and Southeast Asia as well. One of the case studies, the McConaughey chapter is for a Karen village in Thailand where they're afraid to access the Thai legal system. And they're also kept separate from Thai society. And so they are a capsule in Myanmar a capsule of Myanmar inside the Thai border in that respect. So one presumes that the Thai side of the border relative to the state and local options for justice for the local population here is different and would be for the Kren if they were integrated here. What, that, what then does that say about the different processes for the formation of states for local populations and the possibilities of legal pluralism between Thailand and Myanmar and state in space that would otherwise uh, be similar human and geographical non-state space. Thai virtual space being much more clearly developed and accepted 
accepted in limited space within the camp where Thai authorities themselves had devoted devolved justice to camp officials. I think it's fairly clear that Aung San Suu Kyi and the NLD will not change things very much. The state does not have the resources. There is not enough time for Aung San Suu Kyi at least. The geopolitical situation does not favor a strong state in Myanmar. More importantly, I think the historical reasons are still there. There is still not the will amongst the, the Burmar Buddhist leadership to have an equal and inclusive Myanmar. They want Buddhist Burmania. And you can see this in the chapter by Gravers and Jorgensen and their two Po Karen Muslim villages. Muslim and Hindu communities are being excluded. Christian communities are being excluded where involvement of religious minorities in any uh, area of daily life gets taken and represented, uh, then, it's, then it gets presented as them taking over. And they will, as a result, not have a state present in highland areas, in ethnic areas, in religious quarters that local people will trust. And so we'll keep on shoot, shopping around for justice as this book shows very clearly. Well, that's been my um, eight to 10 minutes that I've been allotted. I just sum up with saying, in short, I highly recommend the book. It's invaluable, but I think it has set an agenda where there's much more work that can be done, that needs to be done. And not just forwards, but I think also retrospectively regarding the roots of the uh, the issues that the book discuss. Thank you, discusses. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Michael, for, for those enlightening comments, which add historical perspective to, to the questions. Uh, um, of the book, and now we have uh, Daniel Aguirre uh, with his comments. Daniel. I'd like to start by saying thank you to the editors and the contributors of this book because this is really useful and important book. I only wish I would have had something like this when I arrived in Yangon in early 2014, trying to figure out what was going on with these customary informal systems that nobody wanted to talk about. Um, and th for us, there was just this kind of amorphous thing out there as a legal practitioner that I didn't understand. And it took years to sort of get a grip on it. And I've learned a lot from this book. But what was very clear to us as legal practitioners was that the last place a person in Myanmar was going to go to solve a dispute was a court. And I didn't blame them. I've seen the courts and, the, and, and for all the reasons that are highlighted in the various chapters and in the introduction, it is clear why, and, and also the historical points that uh, Michael has just raised, why this is the case, right? So I, I, I hope there's some way we can get all of the international legal practitioners working in Myanmar to read this book. But what I would also say is if there's any donors or members of the international community out there, someone please pay for this to be translated um, into Burmese and, and, and as much as widely translated as possible, because I fear that, you know, uh, uh, legal practitioners in Myanmar, lawyers, judges, et cetera, don't understand this either, or at least they weren't very good at explaining it to me. Um, and this focus on the previously ignored actors really sheds a lot of light on, uh, on issues that we kept coming up against, the idea that lawyers are brokers. Um, I, I, I saw this throughout the chapters that there's always these kind of people in the community who can get things done, you know, and, and that, that you can see where this idea originates from. And I think also this cultural specific meanings of justice that appear throughout. It's really important for, for legal practitioners to understand, you know, that I talk to lawyers and judges constantly telling me that this was a common law system based on the British model. And it is all about jurisprudence, yet there was no jurisprudence. There was nowhere you could go and get the cases. The judges didn't accept arguments based on jurisprudence, but at the same time, there was no civil law system. So it really, it, where, where are these, these dis disputes being solved? And I also came across, when, when I tried to explore this customary uh, system, people would, would put it down saying, well, it doesn't abide by the rule of law, you know, and that it doesn't uh, match international human rights standards. I say, well, have you been in, in the court here in Yangon? Um, like, I, I, I'm not sure that this is really a valuable criticism of this system, because as far as I can see, the, the, the national, the, the state judicial system doesn't abide by those things either. And so th that, that criticism is, is, is is not valuable, but I also like how this book doesn't uh, 
doesn't do make the, the opposite mistake, which is that, you know, kind of reifying and romanticizing, as it says in the introduction, the, the, the customary system. I often came across fellow NGO workers who, who would just say, oh, well, it, you just have, it's customary. It has to be, this has got automatically good. And the book, all the chapters go into not only the kind of how it works, but also, hey, there are some big problems here, right? Especially when you start talking about the power dynamics at various levels, really interesting. Another really important contribution that this book makes for people like me coming into Myanmar, and I think, uh, yeah, especially for us, is, is part of your methodology throughout, right? And as, as legal practitioners, we probably aren't used to these anthropological, uh, different types of methodologies. And basically, it seems like your methodology involved many, many cups of tea with local people, right? And that's something that I, I found extremely important in Myanmar is this idea that you need to repetitively go to places, that you need to become embedded there, that your team has to be a, a part of that community. And this idea of, of the overcoming being an outsider and finally understanding the perspective of the insider is not something you can do with a workshop um, or a, a, a one or two day intervention. And I think there is a lot of lessons to be learned from this methodology for the international community and interaction with, um, with local justice in Myanmar. The key findings are I, I couldn't agree more, you know, that right across all the chapters, really interesting, the preference for the local, the state evasion, the centrality of cultural norms, social harmony, religious, and the significance of identity politics. But it still doesn't deal with that, the, the two main issues for me that I, I wanted to know what you think, basically. And I think maybe it's the next step from this research what do we do about these two main problems I want to ask about? And that's the first is what happens when religious or customary beliefs contradict justice notions, right? Uh, I can't help but thinking of the, the othering that came up in a few different chapters where um, a Muslim woman is at the intersection between an informal customary discrimination or an official legal discrimination. What is where? How do we overcome the, the, the discrimination at both levels here? Um, chapter five, Nguyen Mon talks about uh, the problems of rec social harmony and reconciliation in domestic violence cases. Like this doesn't really match where we want to go with domestic violence. Uh, uh, Lu Tar in chapter three talks about how the Naga tribal leaders are trying to change customary law to, to deal with, uh, to, to be less discriminatory. Uh, Gravers and Jorgensen talk about the exclusion of Muslims and Hindus. Like, there's a real, there, there's a, I'm not saying that the informal system is better or worse, but it's, it's got the same problem, right? And, and how do we tackle that uh, together? And then what comes across in all the chapters is something that, I struggled with as a human rights lawyer for many years in Myanmar and, and, and around the world, but particularly in Southeast Asia, this strong focus on reconciliation, social harmony, avoiding escalation of conflict, et cetera. You know, Myanmar had, I remember after, uh, in 2014 or 15, it, the, the rule of law and tranquility uh, body was formed, not the rule of law and human rights body, right? Uh, this, this idea that we have to be tranquil. Um, this has a, there's a big problem here for the rule of law, right? The idea where where is the administrative law, the public law? How does a person challenge the state or challenge the local customary governance system? The, 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 there's this huge gap, right? How what happens when the social harmony enforces the social hierarchy? What happens if the dispute is with the head of the village or the dispute is how do we challenge the decisions of that local village elite um, or the local government or that broker or facilitator, or the justice maker, guy, man or woman at, at the local level? This, 
I mean, there's no answer to this question immediately because it's not possible in the national state system either, where there just is an absence of administrative, public, or constitutional law forums. And that really reflects that kind of hierarchical system where you are starting to be able to have a dispute between private individuals, but what about when your dispute's with the government? Where do you go? And I, I know I, I, our, um, the Thang Son mentioned, you know, these land disputes and how it, when they were not satisfactorily uh, adjudicated at, at the, at the, in the customary and formal level. And we all know very well they're not properly dealt with in the official state level system. And this is sort of the closest you get to this idea of what do we do when the state is making core decisions that violate concepts of the rule of law or, or worse, uh, violate human rights, right? So that I think would be a really, really interesting way to go with this. Like, because that was for me, the biggest question working in Myanmar it was trying to find a legal angle to challenge core government decisions, uh, illegal government decisions and impunity of state and non-state actors. So again, I, I, I was delighted to read this book. I only wish I would have had it then, um, but I still have this big question where I, where, I, where I think is the next step for, for all scholars of, of Myanmar and particularly for the activists and legal practitioners from Myanmar to push on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Daniel. Um, we have a, a series of questions uh, from the audience, uh, some of which go actually in, in similar directions than, than those uh, pointed out by, by, by Daniel just now and, and by Michael earlier. Uh, but first, before we go to those questions, I would like to ask Helene and Tang Son, would you like to answer briefly to, to the comments? Tang Son, uh, would you like to uh, go go first, maybe I went first before. Maybe I know definitely you would be able to answer the dilemmas around gender, customary state, maybe, and see what else you would like, and then I can fill in afterwards, maybe, or answer some of the other things. Yeah, you can go first. Helen, you can go first. Okay. I will go for it. Uh, it's, uh, thank you very much, uh, Michael uh, and Daniel, for these, uh, both for the praising words. Uh, I'm feeling a little hot and <laughs> so nice with all this recognition of the, of the book. Uh, and we were a lot of people in, together around this project. So, and I think a lot of the other contributors are, are also listening and taking um, these nice words in. Uh, Michael, uh, thank you very much for uh, bringing in uh, these, insights, insightful insights about the historical. And I think you're completely right that uh, in trying to understand uh, the way that people relate to the state, we need to go before uh, uh, 1962. And this is, I think one of the weaknesses of anthropologists is that we don't have that historical depth. So uh, maybe we should do something together at some point. And I think, um, uh, I mean, we've engaged a bit with uh, James C. Scott's work and of course we've read I've also read some on Myanmar history, but really taking it in, in trying to understand the way uh, uh, that the state, ideas and imaginaries about the state, but also the way that people relate to it as not being only the scars of, of, um, of the civil war, which I think it also is, but that there's a much deeper structural historical background to these things. So thank you very much uh, uh, for this. What I think is interesting also uh, when we talk about lowland and hillsides is I think one of the things that came out in our study is also that it's not so different between uh, low income PAMA and uh, ethnic minorities in some of these justice issues in terms of people's preferences. So there's also something to explore there that we can't always make that distinction, uh, um, especially when it comes to questions about class and economic standing and and history is a deprivation. I think there it's difficult to make always that clear distinction between Bama and the ethnic minorities. So there's something there to explore um, uh, as well. Uh, but thank you so much for bringing um, uh, these things up. And, and Daniel, uh, you had some uh, uh, questions that are of course related to the area of, of practitioner, legal practitioner. And, 
and um, this is not to brag or anything like that, but actually our project has had a very uh, uh, big ambition of also continuously being di in dialogue with both the international agencies working on justice sector reform in Myanmar. Uh, some of them have listened a lot to us and also brought this agenda uh, up. There's the uh, My Justice program, for example, Caitlin Riga, I don't know if you know her, she was in the UN before she's, we also thank her in the book because she's really one of those internationals who has embrace this and I'm sure if you had been there around when we were doing the project you would also have been one of the ever just friends so to speak uh, so there is things going on now also in terms of the internationals trying to move into this field of customary uh, customary justice but it doesn't erase some of the dilemmas that you raised of course and and I'm happy that you also recognize in the book we are not like you know only criticizing the state and romanticizing the local and the customer but trying to bring out some of these dilemmas that doesn't make it necessarily easier for any kind of legal practitioner or just a sector programmer or just a sector reformer for that matter, because if it was so easy, you would just say, okay, let's just put all our money in the customary justice and let's just recognize it as, as it is, uh, or the ethnic armed group justice system. So there's a lot of dilemmas uh, um, here, but I think um, I want to actually give the word to Tang Son because Tang Son also, she has a lot of good ideas about how to work with this, with, with this within the gender field. So some of the dilemmas that come up in terms of gender discrimination. And I know, Tang Son, you also have ideas about how the international community and also how civil society organizations can work uh, within this field. Because I think that's also where we have uh, uh, to look uh, is to the young people and to civil society, uh, uh, the sort of who can facilitate these processes and not just look at the old village leaders uh, and the state officials, but this domain within there, but I want to let Teng Son uh, answer these questions because she's also herself worked within this field with the Mon Women Organization uh, previously. Yes, thank you. And thank you, uh, Mickey and uh, Denise for your uh, comments. And it is very uh, helpful for our next research if we're gonna do it next time. And uh, yes, uh, like Ellen said, for when we study about everyday justice and when we go deeper on uh, to get understand how uh, dispute and crimes are resolved in the ethnic areas and like uh, most of the chapter covers like uh, how uh, the ethnic uh, customary system and uh, ethnic system are working. Uh, we do find and uh, uh, we have uh, I have mentioned a lot. Uh, uh, I have uh, covered a lot uh, on another chapter which uh, on our first book which uh, discussed that even uh, when men find, uh, uh, when most uh, majority of men find uh, uh, convenience and uh, to go to the ethnic justice system, that uh, women still find uh, inconvenience to go to, even to their uh, uh, with own local language justice system, like they fear, uh, they, they, they still fear uh, to speak out and they still fear uh, um, uh, to discuss, especially like when it comes with the women issues. Uh, yeah, so uh, if, when we are studying uh, about uh, the legal bureaucracy and we do uh, found out, uh, the, the research found out that women still fear uh, how um, uh, to, de uh, to speak up their, uh, the, their disputes and their kind, even within their families. Uh, so, um, we we when we talk with the women and they uh, sometimes uh, they they told us that that they uh, if there is a um, uh, uh, village administrators and uh, 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 people in just uh, uh, people who working in the justice system in the ethnic area uh, if there is a women, woman uh, even only when they can feel uh, free uh, freely to speak out their uh, their cases and some. Uh, we found out one woman in the um, NNSB justice system, but she uh, she told us that she do find uh, like a lot, a lot a lot of challenges to be uh, to be part of the uh, justice uh, justice comedy. So uh, we 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 should come with a discussion how uh, women could involved in even in the local levels uh, how that uh, we can uh, uh, provide like access to justice to everyone, not uh, whether women and men. Yes, thank you. And uh, uh, Denise uh, discussed about the local, uh, when, what about when it comes with the uh, local authorities and how to dispute. We do uh, uh, found that uh, there is a, if, uh, 
even the customer registry system, they had their own, uh, uh, the, uh, even in the village level, they had their village rules that when you, uh, when you against the village administration group, you had uh, the, uh, this punishment, what, what you can be uh, uh, punished. And even uh, uh, including in the customer registry as well, uh, they, uh, one case that we study in the MNSP con fully controlled area, they, uh, uh, the, uh, the perpetrators, uh, the perpetrator also like during his uh, case, he also, he also like, uh, against the village administration group and then uh, when it comes with this kind of case, uh, the case cannot be solved uh, in the village level. So they have to go to upper level. Uh, they have a step-by-step -step system. So they go to the village track system and they go to um, township and district and central. So when they come to the like ordinary people and uh, with a village administrator or Men, uh, members of village administrators uh, administration, uh, they cannot resolve the case in the village. So it's already uh, uh, mentioned in the in in their law. Yes, thank you. Maybe I can just add uh, to Daniel's question about uh, uh, how do we resolve some of these dilemmas uh, uh, legally, and I think one of the the challenges is that when you come as a legal expert and want to, you know, support the justice system and changes in the justice system, I think that, and I think our book is also showing that a lot of these issues can't be resolved through legal tools. Um, actually, sometimes you can do more damage or you can run into more problems, damage, not always, but at least more dilemmas and problems by trying to resolve matters through a rule of law sort of instruments. I think you need to look at it more, much more politically and because it is political matters, especially if you're looking at the relationship between customary ethnic justice systems and the state system. And that's also given the history uh, of Myanmar. So I think that's also sometimes where it goes wrong. So I think when you're also looking at tackling some of these challenges and, and um, problematic aspects of customary justice, you talked about ethnic discrimination. We've also, I also mentioned early on also this, how it's so ingrained these ideas that secure your own security is associated by being with your own ethnic group and separated from other groups. So it's very deep, those kinds of ideas of, of uh, compartmentalization and divisions is not something you can resolve through legal means or by saying that this is a human right, you can't discriminate. Yes, you can work with, like you said before, with workshops and so on, but a lot of these matters are things that needs to be resolved uh, uh, politically. Um, I'm just going to uh, speak briefly because there's a message from uh, the press, from the NIAS press, that those in the audience who are trying to buy the book at the moment, uh, if they type LSE South Asia in the coupon field on the publisher's website, they will get a 20% discount. So you should go and buy it right away. Uh, the other thing is that we have a question from Zunetta Herbert. So this is to Zunetta Herbert, if she's listening, that... Uh, we are for some technical reason not being able to send your questions from Facebook to the speakers through the Zoom chat. So we're trying to do it. The other questions we've been able to send, we're trying to do it, but just in case we are not, please accept our apologies in advance. Hans. Yeah, so I, I've been sent the questions and uh, I, will, I will read out a few of them. Um, several of them really go in the direction or cover that you have covered already now in your, your answers. For instance, um, uh, Nan San writes in the comments, uh, in a mixed control area where there may be more than one justice system, have you observed challenging contradictions between the different systems provided by the state and non-state justice service providers? If there are such uh, contradictions, what would be your suggestions on how to reconcile such different justice systems? Um, to put this uh, much more I think critically and, and in, in, in uh, more direct terms, uh, Stephen McNamara writes, is there a risk that everyday justice will result in actual injustice? For example, where the accused person is innocent but is presumed guilty because of previous offense. So how should we critique everyday justice? Um, should we use a modified and updated version of formal justice or what should it be? For, for instance, in the relationship between between monks and uh, uh, and uh, novices, or or between 
men and women or, or army commanders and uh, young soldiers, uh, I assume that um, celebrating local uh, cultural norms and practices might actually result in, in grave injustice. Um, but but I, I feel you have, you have covered a lot of this already. I, I, I just read out one last one um, and then please keep your responses brief so we can cover more of them. There, there are lots of comments from the audience. And um, this again is from Stephen McNamara who commented on um, Daniel uh, and fully agreed with Daniel's comment about the critical lack of administrative law, which enables the decision of the person in control to be critiqued. Would a state or regional independent ombudsman system be useful? So that's a very concrete question and be brief. Um, on the mixed controlled uh, areas, actually, I mean, we found these the most difficult areas for people to access justice because of this strong level of a pluralism of actors and people feeling insecure of what system they should go to, the state or the armed group. Uh, whereas the research that we have done sort of in purely ethnic armed group areas, people felt much more secure because they knew exactly what system they should go to. So there is some need there to discuss. And I know that some people have put pressure on discussing this as part of the peace negotiations, in what ways these systems can work together. And uh, I think one of the acute areas where they ought to work together is around drug, drug uh, dealing, uh, drug trafficking, where there's really potential and where in some respect, both the NMSP and the KNU have done a lot of work in, in dealing with this, but the state system less. So there's a lot of areas uh, uh, of collaboration. So that's that's one thing, is that the places where it's worse for people to get justice and where they're really afraid to, to, uh, to uh, submit cases is where you have these competing systems not working together. Um, so that's one sort of like overall answer, work on these linkages, how can these systems work together? But as I said before, it's difficult. Who should solve it? Because it's not a legal question, it's also a political question. Uh, the thing about when everyday justice becomes injustice, Yes, we do have cases of that. And Tang Son's examples with land confiscation and drug where you have powerful actors, uh, where you have the hierarchy that Daniel spoke about before involved in the dispute resolution. We have huge issues. And we also have a huge gap in the capacity of local institutions to deal with these cases. And in fact, I would say that it's, it's so severe in, 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 in Myanmar that when people feel, face these big cases, there's a very, very, very little chance that uh, they get them resolved. And there are high levels of injustice uh, outcomes in those. Once we speak about more horizontal forms of dispute resolution at the local level, where it is the forms of negotiation and reconciliation that takes place, we did not see many people dissatisfied with the resolutions when it came uh, to the village level dispute resolution. There's the gender aspect that Tang Son spoke about, but the kind of like gross injustices uh, and lack of justice that we saw were much more when it came to these cases that needed to go outside the village level and where none of the systems actually has the capacity or willingness to provide uh, justice for, uh, for people. So that would be my comment to those. I know it's not a complete answer, but uh, Tang Son, do you wanna add? Uh, can you repeat the question when you read the questions? Uh, it was a little bit noisy for me. Actually, I, I think it's yeah. okay if you... Okay, yeah. um, the, the, the following questions also cover uh, similar ground. So maybe I take the next question and you can answer to that. This, this one is by So Min Yu about land rights. And the question is, uh, in regards to land rights, isn't it that the preference for community-based dispute resolution actually is shortchanging ethnic minorities? It's it can be very negative for ethnic minorities if we if we celebrate community-based land rights if if those ethnic minorities are uh, powerless, underprivileged, etc. So, do you see attitudes changing in the future where disputes will be brought up to the state-sanctioned solutions or brought to the state? Uh, increasingly yes uh, uh, there are more detail in the case that uh, in our chapters and uh, about land case and 
we bought, uh, actually this is uh, this land case that we use in our, in our chapter had been uh, uh, taken by the Amerika for a long time, but they, they, they do not uh, dare to speak out because they are afraid of, uh, they are afraid of the uh, military governments at that time. But now when uh, the CSO is come, uh, came uh, to their village and uh, given awareness reasons like human rights and uh, others awareness reasons uh, like uh, development and something uh, uh, so we they told us that they they're trying to collect like collect uh, collective um, actions so uh, uh, administrators uh, group and uh, people in the uh, in the village they came together to to raise their voice that now at uh, this time they they, they need uh, they can claim uh, they are right uh, like for example Lanky. So that's why they, they came to uh, sp speak up and they, they claim about their land uh, to get back. Actually, this is what uh, happening for a long, long time. But um, now when uh, they even uh, trying to uh, find different options uh, how they can reach they avoid more loudness. So for, for example, in our case, like uh, when a, wo a woman, uh, she, she all the way went to the uh, the town, which is close to her village, and she said like groceries from her from her garden, and then she learned from uh, from people in uh, from one by one, and she uh, learned that there is um, uh, a news uh, a news that uh, represents uh, people uh, like for old people. So she when she get back to village, she uh, trying to uh, discuss with the village administ uh, administrator groups and uh, village elder group uh, village elder respected group. Uh, who are already uh, they already have inside uh, inside of their mind that they they should speak out they should speak out but they have uh, uh, they have no uh, they have no way like uh, where do we can speak and how do we can speak because on the other hand they are still have fear inside of their mind what uh, can uh, what will happen to us even like for example drag kids after they uh, uh, they report the drag kids to the police they even uh, uh, during our last uh, visits uh, for the free walk, they still uh, uh, stay in, in fears of when that uh, perpetrator will come and uh, find a, uh, make a problem with them because this, uh, this the perpetrator is very powerful. So uh, like when it comes with the outsiders, uh, when it comes with the people in power, uh, when it comes with, with the people, uh, armed, armed actors, uh, like for example, whether land case and other case, uh, people are still like uh, watching, uh, surrounding, uh, surrounding of their environment, like how people are acting, uh, how people are, are doing, what uh, what other parts of Myanmar are doing to claim back their land right. So uh, even we also that there is not a, 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 a chapter we write about the the new uh, where we also study in the the new sub administrative zone and. The, uh, 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 our respondent also said that uh, we watched the TV that uh, other part of Myanmar are claiming back they are right from the military uh, who who took their land uh, uh, who took their land for a long time and this uh, as soon as they uh, watch the uh, watch the TV from uh, people are claiming back they are right they start to to take action how they can uh, uh, claim back they are right so yeah uh, so people are learning and trying to approach what kind of thing they can do uh, for the for all uh, land case uh, they they try many options they they people are like uh, opening up they're trying not only to the sending the letter to the bna and bno they also approach the mp and they also approach like uh, a connection with like political persons and some those uh, those who can help them yeah thank you Um, thanks a lot. We have another question from I Thierry Kyo, who asks about methodology, and she writes, um, I would be interested to know the criteria for sampling in terms of site selection and the participants. What is your justification for covering some areas only, while the title is Everyday Justice in Myanmar? In terms of the participants, did you interview policymakers, uh, armed forces, uh, etc., to triangulate your findings? Uh, yeah, I can um, I can maybe answer that one. So uh, uh, 
I think one of the things with this research is that this kind of sitting down with a map and then systematically selecting a fieldwork site impossible. Uh, it's very, first of all, it's quite difficult to get access uh, to a lot of the areas where we've done research. So uh, some of the ethnic armed group areas and mixed areas, it was through connections and through negotiations and, and, and through relations. So it was difficult. And even in, 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 in the towns uh, and, and also uh, villages and the government control, it was where we could get permission to do the research. Um, so in that way, we cannot claim to have done a systematic selection based on a certain criteria. That's also why I said in the beginning that we're not doing a systematic comparison. So this is one of the caveats of this kind of methodology. Uh, I think the strength is uh, uh, what Daniel said earlier on, is that what we, our main focus was on trying to go back several times to the same place and get that kind of depth uh, in singular places, but without claiming that we are able to generalize, even with, in current state, we're not claiming to generalize based on the case studies we have. And that's very important also when you read the book, uh, that, that you can't uh, take uh, the insights from one village study in current state and say, okay, then the next villages are the same. In fact, you can see two of the chapters in the book, the villages are very close to each other, but actually the findings are quite different. And I think that's a very important thing to keep in mind. In, in terms of the uh, interview persons, yes, we did cover, uh, and we did use triangulation. We also made a survey uh, in, in the main field sites uh, to sort of quantify and test some of the qualitative findings, not uh, through a sort of statistic, but more like a very small household survey just to check up some of the questions. And yes, we did uh, interview both village leader, ordinary village, and we tried also to have a good representation of, of, uh, of women and men and different kinds of, of uh, ages. Uh, but there's also, again, the systematic part of of, of the, the selection uh, and sampling, we didn't follow in this kind of systematic way because we also trace cases. So we also followed certain cases that we heard from one person and then we spoke to other people involved in the case. So this kind of domino uh, effect or snowballing effect, you can also call it. Uh, and when we were doing participant observations, for instance, at the village, uh, village track administer office in the village uh, uh, that Saxon is from, uh, which is the one in, in chapter one. Then we heard the resolution of one case and then we asked if we could speak to the people involved. We visited them at home and we followed up with those cases. So there it's not like you can sit beforehand and select who you interview. It's more following practice, so to speak. Um, I hope that answers your question. Thanks a lot. I mean, uh, aware of, of time limits, we have to come to an end, but maybe we have time for one or two more questions. Uh, several questions dealt with uh, the kind of practical policy implications of, of your research. And um, Mon saw your heart asks, what would be the legal hooks for the ethnic armed organizations justice system uh, with the national justice system to provide justice to the people? So how could you, how could you link those ethnic armed uh, groups systems with, with the national system? And uh, Moi Moi asks even more directly with your evidence-based research uh, findings, how would you advise the government? That's your one, thanks on. Yes. Uh... As uh, even I mentioned a little bit on, on my presentation that uh, uh, there is, uh, when we uh, talk about to, for a recognize, recognitions of the uh, ethnic arm uh, ethnic arm of EAOs like justice system, there is still, uh, we need to learn more how uh, it works in, in practice uh, because we found, uh, uh, we found uh, also there is still, we need to be done, uh, we need to do more research on like, uh, how the they are uh, uh, just it is working like in for all chapters uh, they, they are still like uh, uh, providing uh, justice and education and development to their people but on the other hand they are still exploiting uh, like land case and other their uh, business interests and political interests so uh, uh, the government or the government and it uh, it's like partner or uh, with uh, international organizations, uh, agency who is working on justice sector, like uh, to go uh, deeper to understand like uh, what 
uh, really working uh, in, in, in the ground, like, like for NNS Justice System and PNU, uh, uh, which is another chapter that we found that it's really working well with their own system. And even there is a, uh, there is a, like a, a challenges and uh, like gap because of the uh, not uh, not recognition from the government, they can't enforce uh, the uh, the resolutions uh, decisions uh, dispute resolution decision uh, freely. And even uh, uh, when we talk with the like um, uh, the justice committee, they, they told us that even now uh, after the NCA after they signed the NCA, they have to reduce uh, some of their boundaries. So. For example, in the chapter one uh, village is uh, very close to the uh, MNSP, like only like uh, for, uh, for uh, when, uh, uh, only twenty minutes to the Myanmar uh, Myanmar police force, and like one hour to the MNSP uh, justice system. But people do feel more comfortable to to go to the uh, uh, like same language and uh, who can understand the nature of what is their feelings and. Who, uh, who they can trust. Even there are some uh, something that we still need to look at, like for example, there are articles, uh, punishment are still very out of date and they still need to work on it. Uh, but the people do feel like to go to uh, who can understand uh, uh, their language and who can understand their natures of how they feel and how they can express uh, freely, except women uh, on that case. Uh, uh, so well, where does, the government should uh, discuss uh, closely with uh, with this uh, customer registry who is practicing this, like whether uh, they, they would like to improve their uh, justice uh, uh, system, like uh, whether they can keep, for example, uh, I, uh, we discussed in the gender chapter, whether they want to uh, uh, keep like woman, uh, woman or uh, uh, translator uh, at the court and at the like police station for ethnic minority areas. Uh, they can do that. Uh, we can uh, we can think about the, uh, this bad patterns. Another way is like to give uh, to give recognition, but not only like just give recognition. And of course, uh, the, the governments and other like uh, it partner can reduce the that customary uh, uh, justice system and what they can improve and what they can uh, um, amendment and how they can uh, work in practically because. Uh, for so far, what we have found all along uh, our our research area uh, is like people use more uh, customary justice than uh, state uh, uh, state system. Uh, as you as, as there are many many challenges because like at, uh, language and uh, because of the trust for a long time historical uh, and political trust they lose trust on the state system. So. These are already mentioned in others' uh, uh, research, but we do uh, also found the same. And so what we can do to overcome these challenges, and on, on the other hand, what we can um, uh, improve for the uh, recognizing the, the uh, EAO justice system and how they can, uh, because when we talk about everyone uh, to assess to justice, we want, uh, we want people to uh, go where they are, where they are belong to, and where they, uh, where they have like, uh, they feel they can express their disputes and how they, for for right now, it, as long as the government is not uh, recognizing the uh, uh, EU justice system, they could, uh, they are still like uh, going like for example in the in in the in our chapter one like the even the um, the very administrator himself is like telling people to go to the, uh, the ethnic justice system. But he, he even told at not, he is not like officially uh, directing them to go to there, but he said that uh, he tell the people the option, how they can go and uh, what is the option and what is the advantage and disadvantage of the state system and the ethnic, uh, the, the customary justice system. So yeah, uh, these are the options and these are the discussion that we have to carry on and we have to do uh, more, res uh, more research, of course, uh, to get more understanding on how the governments and uh, those uh, existing the plural legal system could be more effective for ordinary people. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we've, we have gone over by five minutes, which is a very healthy sign. 
uh, of the interest and of the of the very loyal audience who have been with us all this while, and a big thank you to them. Uh, thank you very much, Elena Maria Q, and uh, me thanks on coin, not only for sharing such an interesting book and its findings with us, but we earnestly hope that there will be a part two to your research. Uh, there's clearly a lot of interest and it is so useful uh, and so informative for so many of us who are interested in that region or in that, in that subject. Thank you, Michael Charney. Thank you, Danny Leguer, for taking the time to, to comment on this book. I know you're all very busy with other um, preoccupations of yours. And my colleague, Hans Steinmüller, uh, thank you very much for moderating the discussion and for holding this whole discussion together. Thank you very much to NIS Press for offering a discount in the course of this uh, event. Thank you, Salisbury Hawk Southeast Asia Center for supporting this event. And thank you everyone for watching. Goodbye from London. Thank you.